You're listening to KLWA 106.5 FM Olympia with Shauna Hawk, a.k.a. Lady Hawk. And I have a special guest today on our show, Rosa Clemente. Rosa Clemente is a leading scholar in Afro-Latinx identity and anti-racist struggles in the 60s and 70s. Among many of her accolades are that Rosa was chosen to be in Ebony Magazine's top 100 most inspirational African Americans. Rosa was also a 2008 Green Party vice presidential candidate and is a current doctoral candidate in the WEB's Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Rosa is an activist, an artist, and a hip-hop scholar, as well as a community and political organizer. Without further ado, let me introduce Rosa Clemente. How you doing? Great. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here and traveling all this way here to Olympia, Washington. So yesterday you gave a lecture and it was extremely instrumental. And, you know, some of the things that at Evergreen and some of the things that really stood out uh, for me was your points around anti-blackness within, you know, various um, communities, brown communities. Can you touch on that a little bit? Well, yeah. Excuse me. I think the last uh, couple of years... Um, the word white supremacy has become um, very mainstream and very understood, which is fantastic because um, back when I was in college in the 90s, to say white supremacy was very controversial, mm-hmm. you know. But, um, and, and someone that really coined the term as a systemic issue was a psychologist by the name of Neely Fuller, and he said, if you don't understand white supremacy, anything and everything will confuse you. Mm. So, you know, especially for young people, they don't often understand that white supremacy is an ecosystem that permeates through everything we do every day where whiteness is privileged. But what's been missing from the conversation is then how do we deal with anti-blackness? Because anti-blackness could happen from the white community. It could happen from other black folks, other brown folks. It happens all over the world, especially where there are African descendants in Latin America and the Caribbean, the Spanish-speaking Caribbean. So um, with now the word Afro-Latinx, Latino or Latina, being uh, the same way very popularized two years uh, about two to the the last two to three years Mm -hmm. what a lot of people who are doing work around that are not looking at is how do you deal with anti-blackness right like you can't just say you're afro latina latino latinx claim being african descendant and then do things that are anti-black and um that conversation is beginning to happen but um I, I, I'm really trying to push it even more forward mm-hmm. um, through my academic work and, and my public life. Uh, you know, I've been definitely one of those, I guess, generational people that uh, for a long time, a lot of people were not comfortable saying that they were black or African descendant mm-hmm. in the larger Latinx community. Right, right. And one of the uh, other points that you had brought up was how that affects us when we go into academia and we go into the, you know, the higher education and how, you know, some of the the things that hit us, we're not prepared for as far as some of the racism that we we may get from, you know, faculty, um, you know, administration. Touch on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, college for me, I I loved my experience after my first year, where then I became involved in a lot of student organizations and leadership. Then at Cornell, it was family. I I was in the Africana Studies program, a master's program that you are recruited to go to and has a long, long history. Cornell has a very rich history of student, Black and Puerto Rican student struggles on there. So, I mean, my experiences at college, and including including now at UMass Amherst, have been great. But it took a year for me to understand my freshman year, to begin to understand what racism was, to deal with it, to take classes about it, to have mentors, mostly black women professors. And so by the second year of of college, as an undergrad, I was beginning to be surrounded by a lot of mentors like Stokely Carmichael or now Kwame Ture, a lot of young lords, a lot of um, Black Panther party members. And so I always had mentors and I always had elders in my life. Mm-hmm. So for me, 
college has always been a very like rich experience of learning, but it, in any college, you do have to fight a lot of micro and macro aggressions against you. And it really shows up in more in a PhD program for a lot of black women. Mm-hmm. So I, I mean, I have many black and Latina women, sister friends that are always struggling with mental health when they get to the big PhD. That's when we should be the most um, acknowledged and celebrated, but that often doesn't happen. So going through the PhD process, I had some moments where I did want to leave. And I was just like, I'll just keep doing the work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But I always wanted to get my PhD. Um, And it was the first time I felt I was picking something for myself and not because everybody else wanted me to do it. Um, And also, I do want to contribute a a lasting uh, legacy to Afro-Latinx identity, because it, it's knowing that identity that probably did save my life from a lot of um, not knowing who I was and not being in good spaces, not being an organizer, not being an activist, mm-hmm. not passing it down. So, yeah, but any higher education experience at this point, I feel, you know, all these higher education, it's 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 looked at as the most advanced place where you can be knowledgeable, right? Mm -hmm. That's what the way it should be. But all these colleges are white supremacist institutions, right? They're part of the system of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Many of them did not even allow black people to go, right? So like it's through the black power struggle and the brown power struggle that we begin to see tens of thousands of African-American, Latino, Asian, Native American people even going to college. Mm -hmm. It was coupled with the latter part of the movement of the 60s of black power, where for almost three years all over the country, campuses were shut down for days. Students were taking over. They were demanding professors, ethnic studies, cultural housing, need blind scholarships, financial aid. Mm -hmm. So now 50 years after the black and brown students struggle to get into these institutions of higher education, they're still predominantly white, male, Eurocentric, Um, Women of color are the first to get fired, the least to get tenured. And students, we never not see uh, every year either some white students doing blackface or some white students um, acting racially aggressive. So, you know, you could look at any year in America and there's always controversies on campus. But those controversies, they're not controversies, they're uh, violence against the people of color on those campuses. And since most most campuses are predominantly white institutions, that's where you begin to see young people either really get afforded to to fight or they end up being pushed out. Mm -hmm. And the only way students of color survive on these campuses is the spaces we have. The Black House, the Latino House, programming, ethnic studies, um, organizations, all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But... um, yeah, it's be- and and at this moment with Trump being president, people will say that colleges are becoming or have been more liberal. Mm-hmm. That's never been the case for any college I've been to. Right. Um, the conversation in the classroom could be liberal, but the administrators usually are not. Mm-hmm. And they still like implement white supremacy and Eurocentric notions of what learning looks like, who is it for, even what art is in the, the school. Like right. how we represent it, we're hardly ever represented, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not easy to go to higher ed. I mean, you have to deal with all of that and then still do your work, right? You know. So I'm always, you know, trying to understand and trying to tell people that students of color can't just go to college mm-hmm. and just be free, right? Right. They have to deal with racism. If you're a black woman, you have to deal with misogyny and sexism. If you're if you're a poor black woman, you have to deal with poverty. You know. All these things, you worried every semester how you're going to buy your books, how you're going to pay your tuition, and then you're also expected to get good grades. Right. 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 So. So two things that comes up for me on that. There's a different, especially in an area like this, that the population of black and brown folks are minimum. So we over here in the great Northwest. Um, And so I noticed that the students 
have a really difficult time navigating that because they don't they are not afforded the opportunities to be, you know, around the, the folks in the movement firsthand. They can't go and take that break. So what are some steps or strategies that maybe you could give us for that? And then the other point um, that comes up also is I think that sometimes you said, you know, students go into college, but the ones that go into college, let's say, and particularly under sports, do you think that there's a certain kind of like sheltering that happens with those students um, versus students that go in and they go under, you know, different, their, their, their focus, maybe, um, you know, uh, what's the word, um, anthropology or science or that kind of thing, um, especially for out here, like a school like Evergreen, they intentionally don't have sports teams. They wanted to do the, you know, the human studies and that kind of thing. So, so yeah, th- what could you, you know, give us some of your thoughts on that? Well, when I was at UMass Amherst um, and I got my teaching assistant assignment, I had basketball players who were African-American in my class. Mm -hmm. What what happens with sports, especially around basketball and football, these are money makers for huge campuses, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the the students, and it's mostly men that are, yes, sheltered. They're told not to take classes in black studies. They live in different dorms. They're often separated from the larger community of black and Latino folks on the campus, Mm -hmm. especially if you're a D1 or a D2 school. So, um, but the, the thing is too, that the, the, the administrators see those people as transactional relationships. They play basketball, they play football, they're bringing money into the school and they're getting a free, as they say, a free ride, which is actually not true. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you look at Division I basketball and the NCAA has been exploiting for years basketball players. um, And it's just become recently that basketball and football players and D1 NCAA athletes are saying we we deserve to get paid now Mm -hmm. because the amount of money the schools make. Um, Nobody goes to Duke because they read about it in a book. People go to Duke because they saw Duke beat UNC. Mm -hmm. So it's it's the same with Syracuse University in upstate New York. So um, that that is it's just it's what it is now if student athletes were to join student organizations or themselves organize they could probably get what they want Mm -hmm. but they're brought in usually during the summer and by the time the fall semester goes the administrators and especially the coaches have done a very good job at separating them from everybody else Mm -hmm. and keeping them separate right you know I've seen it happen yeah yeah and now on the other piece about navigating in a system that is, you know, your numbers are low, you're, you know, you're like maybe the, the fifth out of the whole entire school, black person or brown person in that school, some strategies. And yesterday you really talked a lot about mental health and that kind of thing. So that was um, really stood out. Yeah. I mean, I, I've also evolved in this uh, thinking that I don't know if higher education is like where I want my daughter to go after high school, Mm -hmm. you know, because so much of it is corporatized. So much of it is like mentally unhealthy. Um, And a lot of it now is really socialization towards a career path as opposed to learning. You know, Mm -hmm. it's always going to depend on the professor in the classroom, for sure. There's Mm -hmm. always amazing professors. But I don't know, strategies, the the one thing I always tell people of color is you have to join a student organization. That's what's going to pull you through, Mm -hmm. right? And you got to join it knowing that in this day and age, a lot of people might not show up and a lot of people might not show up to an event you worked weeks on. And then you have to, people don't understand when you're a student leader, all the places you have to go from the president to a dean to get money and approval and all of that. Mm -hmm. But that's part of organizing. And students of color on campuses, especially if they want to be organizers or activists in any movement work, they have to learn how to navigate these white supremacist spaces because they continue on after higher education. Mm -hmm. It Mm -hmm. is not changing. We live in a system that is based on white supremacy. So, I mean, you could end up going somewhere 
um, to a predominantly HBCU and still be dealing with the system of white supremacy Mm -hmm. because it's institutionalized everywhere, Right. right? So... I've seen it, how it worked for me was the minute I joined a student organization, it turned my life around, like what I wanted out of higher ed, which I began to realize, of course, I'm going to get a job, but that's not why I'm here. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just to put on my resume. Right. And I feel students of color get that most most of the time if they're also in a black or Latino studies program. Mm -hmm. Because that's where you're going to have most of the professors of color. That's where you're going to have some real organizing movement, activist programs. Mm -hmm. And that's where you begin to learn, like, and how you couple your intellectualism with your activism is what makes you a great organizer. Right, right, right. Um, Could you also touch on the importance of and some of the roadblocks that us black and brown folks tend to face or or think we will face when we want to put our mental health first and we want to talk about keeping healthy and and, and, uh, good mental health? Well, one of the biggest roadblocks is that there are not enough um, psychologists or psychiatrists that are African-American or Latino, Mm -hmm. Latina, Latinx, Native, Indigenous, Mm -hmm. Asian. Mm -hmm. So often when we go seek mental health, it's very hard to find Mm -hmm. someone that reflects us. You know, so if you're going to a white mental health expert, as much as they've dealt with racism, which some of them have, of course, they will never understand fully what we're going through, Mm -hmm. you know, and and why mental health for so many, uh, for decades until recently, was something you just didn't talk about in our communities, Mm -hmm. because there's a stigma. And there's still a stigma to mental health issues, but people are now more and more coming out, and it's not something that if you tell somebody, it might keep you, um, or or if you tell somebody, they're not going to think you're, you know, quote, crazy. I never like to use that term, but people will say that about you if you're dealing with mental health issues, Mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, how is the system contributing to my mental health? Right. You know, this system of capitalism and militarism and imperialism in the United States is not healthy, period. It's not physically healthy. It's not mentally healthy. Mm -hmm. And I feel people that are more empathetic feel things the most. Mm -hmm. I feel, personally, I fall on a spectrum of empathetic, but not so empathetic like some of my friends I know Mm -hmm. where when racial things happen it really breaks them you Mm -hmm. know and they have to like regroup or they they get um pessimistic or uh just start to let all that seep into them Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know so I feel uh, obviously organizers have most have some level of empathy where we feel these uh racist attacks and incidences way more. Like, for me, I no longer... I tell people, do not tag me on any more videos of black people being killed by the police or Latino people being yes, killed. Yes, thank you. Because what was happening a couple years ago was it got to the point where it was like... A friend of mine, Dr. Jarrett Ball, said it was black trauma porn. Yes. Right? Absolutely. Like... The idea that people were just sharing people's deaths and that and Mm -hmm. becoming desensitized to that, Mm -hmm. what it really was was the system, like, doing what it does, but now it's on full display Mm -hmm. and all over social media. There's, like, no dignity in death for a lot of these folks. Um, It becomes um, something for people to hashtag or tweet as opposed to organize against it. Mm -hmm. And so things like that for me is how I deal with what could be my depression coming back. I just like, I'm not watching that. Mm -hmm. Like, don't tag me on that. I'm not watching stupid movies about like black or Mexicans being drug cartel, you know, and Mm -hmm. I find it even really difficult now to watch uh, documentaries around incarceration, Mm -hmm. right? I do, but they're they're difficult to watch, Mm -hmm. you know, and when I'm watching things with my daughter, we we have to talk a lot about it because it just makes you angry, Mm -hmm. you know, and we have a right to be angry, but the, the anger, if not dealt with, will lead to serious mental health issues. Right. Everybody knows that. And either you're going to break or you're going to start hurting other people because of the pain you have. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, like hurt people hurt people. Right. You know, right. and yeah, so it, it's, it's important that when you're doing the work of organizing that you 
take a break from certain things. Mm -hmm. I've always been really good at that. Like, I've always been the type that will be like, let's go bowling, let's go karaoke, let's just watch a fun movie, let's Netflix and chill. Like, I've always been pretty good, and especially in these last couple of years, of being like, I'm shutting it all down. Mm -hmm. You know, like, the revolution is not coming tomorrow. I'm not going to miss out on it mm -hmm. when it does come. And, you know, I have to be as mentally and physically prepared for when that happens. Exactly, exactly. Can we, uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Yesterday you had talked a little bit, well, you were sharing with us about Puerto Rico and the updates um, and some of the dynamics between different parts of Puerto Rico as far as, like, you know, Luisa and, you know, San Juan, my West, and then also how it relates to what's going on and what we hear from this current president ar around connecting those places to Venezuela and Cuba. So, yeah, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, what's happening currently is that as Trump and his administration prepare to invade Venezuela, they're using Puerto Rico bases to pull in their special command forces and prepare them. Mm -hmm. And the reason they can do it is because we're a colony of the United States. Mm -hmm. Like, they can't do it from Jamaica or Panama or Cuba or, or anything else, but they can do it from Puerto Rico because we're colonial subjects. Mm -hmm. So, you know, by the time this airs, maybe a week after, I have no doubt that uh, Trump and all his people are going to call for a full invasion of Venezuela because they've been wanting the oil for decades over there. Mm. And there's not one country in Latin America or the Caribbean, but really no country in Latin America except for Cuba has ever not had intervention from the United States of America, mm. right? So... Um, we're dealing with issues of neocolonialism and neoliberal economic policies and things like that. But as Puerto Rico, we're also dealing with the colonization. So that's what's currently happening now. And it, it's going to be easier to do because Puerto Rico is still struggling to just get some normalcy. And on top of that, hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans have left. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the ones that are leaving are younger. There's no, they've closed schools. They've closed higher education. There's a lack of housing and almost no jobs. Mm -hmm. So you, people from like 16 or 45 are leaving in droves. They have to. They have no choice. They have to find some work, right? Mm -hmm. And because we're migrants, most of those people are ending up in Florida, which will change the dynamics even in the state of Florida mm -hmm. around electoral politics. But that's what's happening because there's nothing that's been fixed correctly in Puerto Rico. So the entire infrastructure is weak. And if we ever get hit with another hurricane, a hurricane five won't be necessary to like take the island down. It'll be like a hurricane three. Mm. And that's going to happen just because of the nature of climate change. It's island nations first that will be destroyed or disappeared. Mm. So with that said, the resilience of the people who have stayed in Puerto Rico or those of us who have been going back more. I have some friends that have repatriated back to Puerto Rico and moved their families there to help rebuild the nation. Mm -hmm. The things happening locally in Puerto Rico are beyond impressive because the people of Puerto Rico are doing this without any government support. Mm -hmm. And also, if this national emergency goes through, which is looking like it will, um, they're going to pull the rest of the federal funds from FEMA out of Puerto Rico. Wow. And they already they already have done hard. FEMA ha has been a mess. FEMA is always a mess. But to pull the remaining federal funds while we're also dealing with a multi-billion dollar debt that was created by mm -hmm. other people, mm -hmm. it, it's devastating the island. You know, you can't build a nation if you can't eat and you can't drink clean water and you can't build houses that will withstand a hurricane. Mm -hmm. And so with all that, th that's what's happening. So um, can you talk a little bit more, we're going to shift again, a little bit more on the, uh, yesterday you had mentioned women, black and brown women in particular, taking the brunt of these movements and the backlashes and some of that that's going on with, you know, um, the movements like the, you know, Black Lives Matter and the Malaysia those and the and the um, Me Too movement and whatnot. So can you speak on that as well? Yeah, I mean, 
the last, again, a lot of this should be contextualized in what I call the uh, Ferguson era, historical era. So post the rebellion in Ferguson, and actually dating back to Trayvon Martin, this new generation of young African-American, Latino, Muslim, Asian, Native American folks who, for the first time, all of us had a black president, thought that things would improve because of a black president. Mm -hmm. So then when George Zimmerman gets off for killing Trayvon Martin, that generation was stunned. Mm -hmm. Mine wasn't. Right? right. We have seen this over and over and over again in our communities. Mm -hmm. But the way they came together was very different than what we have seen in the past with movement. It was black women, Latino women, undocumented people, queer and trans folks. Mm -hmm. And as these organizations began to grow, like B1P100, Black Lives Matter, Mi Gente, Dream Defenders, Southerners on a New Ground, Asada's Daughters, all of them are led by black women, Latina women, queer women, mm -hmm. trans women. Mm -hmm. And that is phenomenal because what it has done is it has made these spaces of organizing uh, healthy as well as non-patriarchal, right. right? So what happened when Trump got elected was that once he got elected, it gave collectively white people so much anxiety, and they had already been having it because of Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. um, that now uh, racism and white nationalism is so front and centered and tolerated, right, mm -hmm. by this president and by a lot of people around him. And what that has done is put these leaders in very perilous positions where they often get death threats. People will show up at their house. People are threatening to kill their children. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know from the Women's March alone that uh, Linda Sassour and Tamika Mallory and Carmen Perez and Bob Bland is white, so she has, has not had to deal with the same thing. But those three sisters can't go anywhere without a bodyguard mm -hmm. because of the number of threats that they face. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the same thing for a lot of the other young folks where they've been targeted by the police. Ferguson, four activists that were part of the rebellion have been murdered, hmm. or, or three, and one uh, died of a health issue. Hmm. And those cases have not been solved. So if people look at and study the counterintelligence program from the 60s, what the FBI was doing then to the Black Panthers, to the American Indian Movement, the Weather Underground, the anti-Vietnam war struggle, to feminists, to artists, mm -hmm. was surveilling everybody, from John Lennon to Jane Fonda, you know, who are white folks. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember having a conversation with Jane Fonda, and she's like, for five years, I was followed every day. Like, I was clear. Mm -hmm. I've had this conversation with people f from the Young Lords, and then I know, because we have still political prisoners in the United States, like Leonard Peltier and, and Mumia Abu-Jamal and mm -hmm. other folks, right? Mm -hmm. And the assassination of Fred Hampton in 1969 was the clearest sign, mm -hmm. right, that the state was now not only causing disruption in these movements and organizing um, organizations that it was straight up assassinating leaders. Mm -hmm. So as a historian, I'm able to not only contextualize, I understand what these women, I, I don't personally understand, I've, I've had death threats myself and that, but I know what these sisters are going through. Mm -hmm. And the, it's a heavy burden to bear. And it's also heavy when you still have men black and brown men that are patriarchal and 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 transphobic and homophobic because mm -hmm. you have to deal with that mm -hmm. and then you have to deal with the state then you have to deal with being followed mm -hmm. you have to also deal with people who hate on you you know because you're a public figure mm -hmm. you have to deal with people calling you a sellout then it's a lot right. you know and these sisters have been navigating it phenomenally mm -hmm. but you know, every time I see them, I, one thing I said is, like, at one point, 
you cannot let them take any more of your time. Mm-hmm. And what I often tell them is don't respond anymore. Mm-hmm. You don't have to respond. Right. You don't have to apologize anymore. Nobody should be forcing you to apologize, right? Because then the, the time spent on just dealing with how someone feels about me, what are white people going to say about me? And, you know, am I going to be able to, I don't know, get invited to some event? It's a waste of time. Because when you're part of trying to change the system, you, I mean, they're not trying to reform the system. They're trying to change and abolish these systems. Mm-hmm. That's what scares the state the most. Mm-hmm. And it's apropos that it is black and brown women because it's always been that way. There would be no Marcus Garvey without Anna Garvey, mm-hmm. right? There would be no Frederick Douglass without his wife mm-hmm. and how strong she was. Um, or just, you know, the plethora of women of color that have always been on the front lines. Mm-hmm. It's just that this generation is not only on the front lines, they're also not going to deal with behavior um, from men and really the patriarchy Mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. in every step of the way they're trying to smash that as well and support other women you know and and even if we don't all politically have the same ideology I am clear and I hope all the sisters I know are clear as well that we have each other's backs Mm -hmm. and in fact when Black Lives Matter was becoming popularized Mm -hmm. right um that first year I had moved to L.A. and moved into a place called St. Elmo Village, and Patrice Colors was my neighbor. She was there. Mm -hmm. So in a couple of days, I knew, oh, this is Patrice Colors from BLM. Mm -hmm. And she would come. We lived right next to each other. We would talk, you know, and I would just say to her, no matter if I think, you know, maybe I don't agree with how you're going to do that or maybe that's not my the perfect political ideology. Mm -hmm. Not only do we have to support each other, what me and Dream Hampton and this other sister, Asha Bandeli, did is they started tweeting about Black Lives Matter being founded by men. Mm. And we all at the same time, we weren't all together, but at the same time, we were like, you will not erase black women. Okay, again. Again. (laughs) And we were like, BLM is Patrice Cullors, Opal, Alicia Garza. Mm -hmm. And then Alicia wrote a a thing about black women founded, and she put a prime, uh, uh, I'm sorry, an op-ed out. So when we began to all meet, you know, they were all kind. They were like, thank you for uplifting us. And I was like, there's, it's not about really thank you as much as like, we, I'm a, first I'm a historian. I'm not going to let you get erased. And mm-hmm. second, me and my generation of women were erased. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to see that happen to them. Right. For me, like every time they shine, we're all shining awesome. together. You know, when Tarana Burke has been doing work for me to her for 15 years, mm-hmm. And then the moment comes where it all comes together. Mm -hmm. So not only is she an amazing organizer and she does work about the survivors, not the predators and if they're going to go to jail, Mm -hmm. but the survivors. But she knows we've had her back and we'll always have her back Mm because things will come in waves when you're that visible. You know, so that's really a critical, important thing that my generation of women have been doing and um, also, you know, learning from them Mm -hmm. and checking ourselves and some of the um, backward and kind of stagnant things we were doing that just had to stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And right here, before we uh, get ready to close out, could you touch a little bit? You did actually start bringing it up as far as like erasure of black women um, in the movements and whatnot, but in particularly along the lines of media representation, hip hop, um, how that has happened and how we can work to, you know, undo that. And what are some of the organizing strategies that we can take now here in the era, in the Trump of era of era of Trump. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I don't do any uh, organizing around hip-hop anymore. It's completely stagnant and regressive, and the men Mm. of my generation don't seem to learn anything, Mm -hmm. you know, and you see less and less of people like me, Mm -hmm. you know, 
involved in the larger like hip hop organizing world because I don't even think it exists. Okay. Um, you know, now hip hop as a culture is strong, mm-hmm. especially outside of the United States. Mm-hmm. It's not about like what MC is good or what graffiti artists are good or what DJ. All those people exist. Is that for a long time we tried to have some type of hip hop political movement mm-hmm. and it completely was co opted mm-hmm. and um, folks did sell out for money and fame and all of that, mostly men. Mm -hmm. And then now, you know, some of us are approaching 50 and you still have men, you know, that are well-known men in hip hop that are transphobic. They're, you know, saying awful things about LGBTQ people. Mm -hmm. Um, They're saying awful things about women, Mm -hmm. you know, and even some women like Erica Badu still clapping for you know, R. Kelly. Kelly. Now she, you know, she comes up in hip hop culture. Mm -hmm. She's more R&B singer. But, you know, this idea that some of the women in my generation are now once again saying like, there's this whole conspiracy to see to bring black men down. Mm -hmm. Right. Because people are finally not going to allow sexual violence and assault to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, that's always been happening in hip hop. Right. Right. So, we have always been erased. Hmm. Now, for me, what I do, not only do I really, I'm a, I archive everything, mm-hmm. you know, um, but I also will always come out and be like, yo, we're here, you know, and the way this is being framed as like how hip hop thinks is not like if I'm going to be hip hop, that or you're going to be hip hop you can't be doing these misogynistic sexist things mm-hmm. but they are and they continue to get away with it which is why you see even less than young when you talk to young people and you're like hip hop politics they're like what like I'm listening to J. Cole you know right, because right. and that's the fall of my generation mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and not the women because, right. you know, from Joan Morgan writing about hip hop feminism to uh, Dream Hampton's articles to uh, men like a Kevin Powell or a Dr. Mark Anthony Neal or someone like Davy D or Dr. Jarrett Ball. This we we we've kept like the political hip hop stuff going. Mm-hmm. But if something doesn't have like if it's not nourished and something is not taken care of it dies Mm -hmm. right so I organize now based on my politics I don't organize just with because you're Puerto Rican Mm -hmm. I don't just organize with you because you you're you love hip-hop I want to know what your politic is, especially around capitalism, Mm -hmm. right? And especially around militarism and imperialism. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to know. So if you're Puerto Rican and you're repping statehood, I'm not f***ing with you, period. I know you're going to have to erase that, but, (laughs) you know, I'm not not doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, That's when identity politics goes wrong. So now I'm at... I'm in a very good place where I can choose and be like, yo, I want to be down with that. Mm-hmm. This is how I want to be down. Or actually, no, I want to support you. Mm-hmm. Or I want to uplift your organization. Mm-hmm. And the one thing I know I've done that I'm very proud of is I've always been a bridge builder. Mm-hmm. I'm always like, yo, we got to like connect. We got to work. I know somebody that has a great idea. Let's do this, you know? Mm-hmm. So media for me, is now be, has been important because I'm I became an independent journalist just by writing my truth. Mm-hmm. I'm not trained, but I understand how powerful media is in cr- creating a narrative, right. and that people like me need to not only talk about the narrative, we need to make sure it's written down Mm -hmm. and it's memorialized, right? right? And that's how I was able to go to Puerto Rico, Mm because so many people trusted that I would do the right thing when I got there, which was report the truth. Mm -hmm. So it all comes together. It takes a while, but it comes together. And if you're doing this work, as long as you have integrity, even when you think you're by yourself, it will show up later. You'll have people who will be like, Uh, 10 years ago, you said this and or whatever, or you ran for office. I didn't like it when you did, but you did. And now I get it. Right. Mm -hmm. Because people respect integrity. Mm -hmm. And lastly, what I tell folks, and this is the hard part, you don't have to like everybody. Like the, you know, this idea that in organizing spaces, everybody's supposed to like each other and hang out with each other and always be together. Mm -hmm. No, 
don't have to like you personally. You don't have to like me. Mm -hmm. But if we're united around climate change, let's go. Like, mm -hmm. and, and that takes, for women, it takes a little longer because we always have this need to be liked. Mm -hmm. Even if we're strong politically, we're always like, what? You know, we'll walk in a room, 100 people love us, but that one person doesn't. Right. And we're like, why don't you like me? Mm -hmm. Instead of the 100 people. Right. I think that comes with age. You know, uh, I think it comes with wisdom. And I think it's just always about standing on the right side of history. And that's what I've always tried to do. I've made mistakes, but I always try to s stand on the right side of that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any last minute words you want to give us as we get ready to let you go to your next uh, event? Actually, our workshop we got going yeah. on. <laughs> I mean, I would just continue to tell people to see what's going on up in Puerto Rico and to uh, go to our website, PROnTheMap.com, and also encouraging people to really look at what potentially is going to happen in Venezuela, because we have so many people that call themselves progressives that want intervention, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I've seen it, and I'm hearing people, you know, one day they hate Trump, and now now they want, you know, they're supporting him trying to invade uh, Venezuela. And that's mm -hmm. dangerous mm -hmm. because the global south is where a lot of movements and organizing and cooperative economics, learning, and even farming, a lot of lessons people here in the United States have gotten around those issues is from the global south. Mm -hmm. The global south is the majority. So it's clear why these particularly old white men mm -hmm. are trying to gasp this, this is it. Mm -hmm. This is like their last bit of power, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And exactly. they're trying to hold on to it, yep. right? <laughs> yeah. And they're not going to be able to hold on to it because we, we got people in our movement that are just not about voting, mm -hmm. but about grassroots organizing. So that last bit of power, they, they're seeing it slip. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's such a strong backlash. That's why hate crimes are rising in the United States. Mm -hmm. That's why white men are now going around talking about they feel aggrieved or they're now a minority. Mm -hmm. And that's all crazy, right? Mm -hmm. Not all white men, but a bunch, a, a good number of them. Mm -hmm. But that's crazy because your privilege still allows you to run anything. Huh, exactly. You know, so... It's like the that dragon's last breath, and that's what we're we're up against, and we're up against it in a way that's not about just conversations. That there's violence being uh, inflicted on us from the global south to the United States, all over the world where we are, and we have to fight that back. Exactly. Thank you so much, Rosa, for joining us here at COA 106.5. We will be having this um, play on a regular basis on our show. So thanks so much. Appreciate Thank you for you. having me. You're welcome.